Good morning, Southside. Special welcome, and I'd like to greet you as well. Anyone visiting, we are always happy to have you come worship God with us, and we are glad to have you. just wanted to make an announcement about that service tomorrow for Chloe Dickens. It's going to be at 10 a.m., as Brian mentioned. Um, one thing they wanted me to share, that it's, they truly want it to be a celebration of her life and home going. So they asked that you don't wear black, but you wear bright and Disney. That's what their daughter loved, and little uh, princess dresses, whatever you want to come in. So uh, if you did not know the Dickens family, Chloe just loved a celebration. Bring your kids and just come be a part of that if you are able. I got a good report last week. Um, My son Jordan was leading worship at West Denver Bible Church. Um, This week the choir is there singing as well at that church. Um, Just great things are going on. God is really doing beautiful things and in, in uniting them, saving. It's just been really neat. So as I study Philippians, uh, this is it, the, the koinonia that we're sharing with one another and going over and serving, and there's just such a oneness. Uh, Kent Hughes called the letter to Philippians the fellowship of the gospel. And when we light, lock shields together for the gospel, it is just beautiful. I was up in Dillon last Sunday to hear a friend of mine, John Collins, preach and another brother and sister who went to church here for many years, Adam and Natalie Parker, are up there. And these two men now are on the preaching rotation as they're going through the gospel of Matthew. And again, great things are going on up there. Their community groups are doubling and their church and the gospel of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed and people in Dillon are being converted. So praise God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ. Don't get lost in lesser matters in these last days. Give yourselves to this. As we prepare to open the Word of God now, we've been going through this book, Sunday Matters, by Paul David Tripp. And what he reminded us this morning is that the human heart is an idol factory. It has turned from worshiping the Creator to worshiping the creatures. And so this is a time where we come and we reorient of, of just that God is all and all. And any idols that we've walked in here with that have been leading us astray, this is the place to be reminded again that nothing else will ever satisfy you but God worshiping and obeying and following after him. So my prayer is that God would reorient every mind and heart to God and God alone this morning in our worship service. We're gonna go back to Paul's letter. If you'll turn then to Philippians Two weeks ago, I was able to introduce this epistle and set the foundations, Uh, and this morning we're going to move in to verses 1 through 2. Let me read those to you now. (coughs) Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this introduction. I thank you for how pregnant it is with truth and meaning for our souls this morning. I ask now, Holy Spirit, that you would take these words and you would illuminate them into the minds and hearts of your people. God, that we would not just understand them in our minds, but that we would get it in our heads and you would bring it into our hearts and that the transformation that the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians would happen in each life in this room. God, I pray that this would be a season of transformation. God, that we would walk more like Jesus Christ, that we would shine him brightly into this dark and dying world. God, would you meet us now in this time of worship in the word of God. Be glorified, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Your outline for this morning is Paul's going to give three distinctives of being a Christian. And the first distinctive is that we have a a distinctive identity now that we are believers in Christ. Secondly, we have a distinctive reality of being a Christian. And then I want to look lastly at this distinctive experience of being a Christian. So if you'll journey with me through these three points. The first one is now as believers in Christ, we have a distinctive identity. And a believer must be conscious of this identity. 
And in the church today, there's a lot of discussion that's coming to life and being talked about, about coming back to our identity in Christ. It, it seems as if the church drifted from understanding this principle and they're trying to regroup it now. And so we need to understand this. We have to know who we are or we're going to make our identities of, of this world and they're going to wreak havoc in our lives. We, we live in a world that is preaching false identities to us every day. This is who you are. This is what you should live for. And Paul's coming and saying, this is your identity. So the question for you this morning is, who are you? Who are you in this big world? And Paul's going to give you three aspects of this identity as he opens up this letter to Philippi. And it's so wise to begin a letter with who God has made you so that you can live a different kind of life and existence as you sojourn to glory. We're to live different. We're to be set apart in this world. And Paul wants you to understand your identity so that you can go and live what we're going to learn in Philippians. And so there are three aspects of this identity that he gives to us. The first one is that you're a bond slave. You're a bond servant, he says, of Christ Jesus. And so as we begin, what do you see as a problem with this English translation or understanding of this term is what comes to mind for me when I think of a slave. I think of forced obedience. I think of fear. I think of non-volition. It doesn't conjure up a lot of joy when Paul writes that. I just don't jump out of my seat. Yes, bond slaves. But these two just seem opposite. And what many experience as the Christian life today is this bond slave that it's fear and it's I have to do this. And so trying to live a set of rules that you don't really want to. Some of you are sitting here and this is your life right now. I just, I don't really want to do these things, but I don't want to go to hell, so I'm trying my hardest to do the things that I don't really even want to do. That's how I viewed Christianity when I was an unbeliever. You, you Christians are slaves. I, I just, you poor slobs, I would look at you and laugh. They have to be goody two-shoes. They, they can't have fun. I'd rather laugh with the sinners and cry with the saints. No, thank you. I'll, I'll take my freedom. Is that what Christianity is? In one word, Paul is going to encapsulate Christianity into a nutshell. And it's this word, bond slave. A bond slave. And I just first want you to consider, how did one become a slave? And then we'll look at the freedom. You were conquered. You would, a, a, an enemy would come in and conquer your land and take you away and make you slaves. Or if you were born of a slave, you automatically became a slave. Or you were sold into it because there was a debt or something you couldn't pay, and you were sold into slavery to pay that debt. And so the question came then, they understood slavery well on the day this was written. How could a slave ever get their freedom? Well, they would have to earn their freedom and work for so many decades or whatever it is until they could to be, be set free. Or they could buy it. Or it could be given to him by someone who could come and pay the redemption price and they would serve and you could go free. And so this is where the gospel begins for Paul. <clears throat> Christ redeemed us from our slavery. We were held captive by the devil to do his will. We loved our jailer and our master, Satan. We were his slaves. We, we followed whatever he said, whatever he did. And the question is, isn't this just an exchange of slavery, the gospel? You go from serving Satan to now you're a slave of serving God? Well, yes and no. But I want you to hear this. Romans 6 says you were a slave of sin, now you're a slave of Christ. But the second service is not like the first. And that's the identity that Paul's shooting at for you this morning. The word for slave is doulos. A doulos was one, was a slave who, who would serve, and he was now given his freedom. What we're talking about, he could go free, and he would say, I, I love my master. I don't want to leave. I want to serve him now. And they'd put this little awl in his ear, which represented, I am now a doulos. I'm a willing slave. I love 
serving my master. And that's how Paul starts this letter, I'm a doulos. Christ has come and he paid our ransom with his precious blood. The royal divine blood of Christ on Calvary's tree. That was the ransom price so that I could be set free from my slavery to sin and death and the devil. And now we love him. We love him and we are the most willing bond slaves. That's what I love about this gospel. I, I love serving Christ. It's our joy. It's our delight to serve the king of kings. I find no greater satisfaction than serving Christ. And I have no greater burden than when I don't obey him. And that grief just keeps deepening. And I pray that's true of every heart. That I, I hate not pleasing my Lord. And if I could do anything I wanted every day, it's just simple. I would serve Christ. That's what the gospel does to the heart. The cords that hold me now are not whips they're not shackles and they're not cells. They're the bonds of love. And they hold me tighter than any chains ever could have held me. It's not the fires of hell that bind me. It's the sweet mercies of Christ that have taken my soul. I need no fences and I need no chains. I would never flee from my master. Where else can I go for you alone, Christ, have the words of life? You can't tempt me to leave to better conditions because there's no better condition than dwelling with Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm hope, hope, hopelessly and wonderfully lost in love with Christ. I've been bought with a great price. Therefore, I will honor God with my body. I am a doulos, a willing bondservant. My will is laid at the feet of Christ for his service. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.15, And he, Christ, died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Romans 14.8, If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And Romans 6.17, Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed, and having been freed from sin, you became due losses to righteousness. You became willing bond slaves to serve Christ Jesus. Is that the consciousness that you maintain? So as Paul begins this letter, your first identity is I'm a willing bond slave of Christ Jesus. Second identity is Paul says you're a saint. You're a saint, and we need to think of ourselves in this way. I kind of grew up in a way that the, the idea of saint has always messed with me just a little bit. And Paul wants me to think of my identity is that I am Saint Kenneth. <laughs> saint Bob. It's beautiful. Saint Taylor. Saint Noah. It's just a beautiful title that he, he wants you to walk around thinking that I am a saint. And for me, that still is hard. Rome has confused many on this term. And we meet someone who's truly living for Christ at an exceptional level, and we say, those are saints. I, I, I went to buy a car, and the, my salesman, he said every day, every time I go in there, he goes, do you know who the saint of the day is? And I'm like, I don't. And he'd always say, he has a little calendar that told him every day who the saint of the day was. And that day it was a guy whose head was cut off and he picked it up and he walked away and continued preaching the gospel later when he put it back on. That's, that's a saint. And it really flipped him when I, I told him, well, I'm Saint Kenneth. And, and he's looking at me thinking, you are not a saint. <laughs> and I am a saint. I, I, it's not the spiritually elite all believers, he says here, I, I write to all the believers in Philippi who are saints. Don't miss the word all. The, the weak ones, the strong ones, the ones progressing, the ones stuck. Every one of you, he's saying saints. You are saints. <laughs> Live into that identity. The all who are in Philippi now, this merchant, this slave girl, this violent jailer that begins the church, they are saints. And so what is a saint? Two words, to, they were selected and they were separated. So when you think of yourself, I've been selected by God and I've been separated unto service to him. 
When I think of Israel, they were an unholy, unrighteous people. And God says, I, I, I set my love on you. I chose you. I picked you, not because you were greater or better than the other nations. I, I did it because I chose to love you. And I set you apart for my purposes in redemptive history. And so you have been selected by free, sovereign mercy that God has, has set his love on you and chosen you before the foundation of the world. And he's, he's brought you into his heart and called you. And then he separated you from sin and the gospel. And now you are God's special use instrument. And in, in, in the Old Testament, if they'd take a utensil and they'd bring it into the temple. And now it was holy. It was holy because this utensil is now used for service to God. And God has taken you and he's plucked you out. And now you're his utensil in this world. You're separated to God. You exist as a saint to be used for the service to God. He put you in Christ and he made you a saint. And so Paul says to the saints in Christ Jesus. And the way you get to be a saint is by faith. You are joined to Christ and now you've been called out and you've now got this special relationship. You have an identity of a child of God. And so Paul's saying this must be the consciousness of the believer. I'm a saint. I'm a set apart one for God. I've been selected by him to manifest his character into this world. I, I live into this every day. I am his representation. I'm his epistle to shine forth his glories. Peter captured it well. You're a chosen race. You've been selected. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, set apart, a people for God's own possession. Why? Why? that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you're the people of God. And you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You have been set apart to proclaim the excellencies of God, Saint Kenneth, Saint Robert. We've been set apart for service to God and to put his name on display. I'm a saint. I can't talk, walk, or think like I used to. I can't be an ordinary lost man any longer because I've been separated and consecrated to God and I want to reflect his character to the world. And then the other identity that he wants us to get is the terms of the relationship that you bear to God. And so your identity is this, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. Our Father. Can you think of a more precious identity than that? And that really has been life-changing for me is to get that my identity, it's not a pastor, it's not a husband, and it's not a dad. My main identity is that I'm a child of God. And I see so many who struggle in this journey and in their life because this main identity is not what's marking you off. This identity is that I am a child of of God. Is there any other t title that you would rather bear than child of God? I walked through a store and it had a magazine that said the sexiest man on earth. No one from this church was on it. <clears throat> <laughs> the other, the wealthiest man alive, the best athlete in the world, the greatest mind of our time. How about the woman who walked in and washed his feet? Her, her identity was just sinner. Now your identity is a son or a daughter of God. I pray that doesn't land lightly on any heart this morning. We must live with a conscious reality of this truth. This is our identity. God is not just some power out there. He's power. He's transcendent. But he's very near and he's drawn near in Christ into a paternal relationship with us. And he cares for me and he pities for me. And I can come to him with personal acquaintance. I am a child of God. And what a relationship I was thinking what I have with my children because I'm their father. And anyone in here who's a dad, you know this, that your heart just goes out to the, your children. And, th and there's really nothing they could do that would ever make me say I'm done with you. When they're really messing up, I draw near more. 
And I just want you to see that the beauty of being a child of God, the creator of this universe is your father. If you lived into that identity, nothing touches you. Thank you, Paul. So our lives must be regulated by these three realities. We must be conscious of them. Paul wants his readers to have this in the forefront of their mind before he begins to say, here's how I want you to live. You're a slave. You're a willing bond slave. You're a saint. Set apart for God. And you're a son or daughter of God this morning. Isn't that beautiful? Now Paul wants to move secondly That you have not just a distinctive identity, but also a distinctive reality of being a Christian. One element of Christianity, it's unlike any other religion, as we mentioned in the first point. You have union with Christ. You You are saints in Christ Jesus. So the reality is now that, that you have this vital living relationship with Jesus Christ And all that he is now is yours. It's for you. His life is yours. His death is for yours. It's it's been a substitute. He's been a representative head. You are saints in Christ Jesus. So this isn't just believing a set of principles. It's not just your code of conduct. Many live differently than other men. Go to every religion, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, just get in and study, and you'll see that they they all have moral codes of conduct. But the founder of Christianity lives in us and us in him. Right away, I want you to know your reality, a distinctive reality is you are joined to Jesus Christ in a vital living relationship. We have the living God dwelling in us. In the New Testament, 164 times it says you are in Christ. This gospel, God takes you and he engrafts you into Christ. You are a vine and a branch. Don't ever get over that you have union with Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What an experience, what we have. You've been joined to his life. You've been joined to his death. You've been joined to his resurrection. And Paul says, I don't want a righteousness of my own. I want that which comes through faith in Christ Jesus. You're joined to his righteousness. I just want that righteous garment put around me. Hokema, the commentator, said, Christ communicates himself in such a way that changes us without diminishing us, that transforms us without deifying us, that Christianizes us without making us Christ. And so we are joined to him. And this is where the transformation of life will come from. Union with him. And so my relationship, it's not merely legal. And I love the Reformation because it had to go after this legal standing of being justified and being right before God, the judge declaring you not guilty. And so it, it is legal. But that legal declaration that's over your life, child of God, is vital. And it's joined you to Jesus Christ into a real relationship. He is now living in me and I am living in him. And he's working out his grace through me. And we're going to hit verse six, that he who began a good work is faithful to complete it. And so vine and branches, the whole sap of my Christianity must flow from Christ. I must cling to him and squeeze out every drop of his grace. So anything that does not have Christ at the center, the middle, or the end is not Christianity. And so we've been joined to Christ. You are in Christ and you are in Philippi. And I'm going to talk about those distinctions later in the epistle. But what I'd like to do now is go to the third distinctive. So you have a distinctive identity. You have a distinctive reality. You have been joined to Jesus Christ. And now you have a distinctive experience because of that as a Christian. (coughs) The heart and soul of this letter is grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to make some observations on the nature of this greeting. 
And so as I was thinking through it this week is, how do you regard what Paul is writing here in verse 2? Is this a prayer? Is this Paul's wish? What, what is Paul wanting us this morning to get from this greeting? And I went back to where Jesus sent out the 70. And in Luke 10, he says this, As you go out, whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to the house. And if a man of peace is there, meaning gospel, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And so this peace would come in. It was conferred to them. And if there was a proper heart where there was faith in the household, the pronouncement was not just an empty greeting. It was this blessing of peace upon this earth, this house. And faith would receive it, the peace. And in the letter that we're reading this morning, if Paul could have been transported from his prison cell in Philippi, if he could have got on a plane and, and, and flew in there, I, he, he would have showed up at the church service. That'd be so cool. You're sitting there to worship and Paul walks in and he stretches out his hands to the whole congregation. He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who would hear this with a believing heart, it was conferred to them in that pronouncement. And since there is no plane, and Paul's in prison, he writes to them, and he comes right into their assembly as they read it, just like this morning, with the authoritative pronouncement and conferral of grace and peace is given to the believing ones. It's much like a benediction. And so all who believe this morning, let this fall on you in power and receive this pronouncement of the canopy in which you sit under this morning. And the canopy which you sit under this morning is grace and peace. I've been drinking that up all week. Father, I pray for this church right now. I pray that we would all right now understand what Paul is desiring for the church at Philippi and for the church in Southside. God, would you meet us now and help us understand these terms. Don't let them be familiar, things we've grown up with our whole lives. God, this is the essence of Christianity, and this is what every heart needs this morning. I desire for every heart to be taken up with grace and peace. God bless us as a body, I pray. Amen. Grace. I think it's the hardest word I've ever tried to define. We have a whole Bible trying to define it, and it's going to take all of eternity to grasp the fullness of it. So, if you don't got your arms around it, don't feel bad. I, I've, I'm going to take some shots at it. It's power. It's God's power engaged for my good in conforming me to Jesus Christ to present me to his son as a bride on the last day. Um, it, it doesn't take into account my merit, my worthiness. It's the freest thing that God does. Mercy draws out his bowels of compassion. Grace is just his freeness to show favor and blessing upon you. It's all from God. It's all of his dealings with me are in favor. It's just grace. It's undeserved. It's the essence of the whole gospel. It's unmerited favor in operation for our good. Just, it, it comes from God's heart. Please hear this. It's not drawn out. It's not going to be you living a certain way, trying to make God feel sorry for you. You will never be able to draw out grace. It just originates from God's heart, and he sets it upon those whom he desires and pleases. It comes from God. Paul David Tripp said, Grace is a story, and grace is a gift. It's God's character, and it's your hope. Grace is a transforming tool, and it's a state of relationship. Grace is an experience, and it's a calling. Grace will make you acknowledge that you cannot earn God's favor, and it will remove your fear of not measuring up to his standards. His grace will bring you right into his presence, meeting all of the standards. And Paul said in Romans 5 too, you stand in grace. By the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're brought, uh, that preposition, you remember, there's a circle and it's called grace and you're brought right into the middle of it. So by the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're plunged into the grace of God. You sit here this morning, believer, basking in all of God's grace. You're not trying to get into it. You're in it. 
You're right in the middle of all God's favor for you because of Jesus Christ. All that he has done brings you right smack dab into the middle of grace. Paul said, you are not under the law any longer. You're under grace, and that is going to make you more holy than the law ever could. As we move into Philippians, my desire is transformation for every heart in this room, and it's only going to come by grace. If you're still under the law, trying to perform, trying to get God's acceptance, his favor, to get him to like you, to get him to justify you, you'll never live a Philippians kind of life. This morning, the call is, I want you to enter into grace, is what Paul's saying. I want you to enter into the full favor, love, acceptance, adoption that you have in Jesus Christ with God the Father. Quit living, I hope he loves me, I don't think he does, I didn't do, quit living under law and you enter into grace where he loves me with an infinite, abundant, eternal love because of Jesus Christ. That will be the foundation for any change that you'll ever get into your life. And I've been a pastor so long now, I'm the old guy, and I've watched so many people try to change their lives where they're not sure. And they spend all their days, just, I just, every time you blow it, you say, I'm not a Christian. Just every time. And you just spend your whole life living under that. And you, you've never, you're not going to change. Paul wants you to enter in this morning to grace, the gospel where I believe and I repent and I come to Jesus and it's all favor now under God, under the work of Christ. Enter into the fullness of it. Believe it. Bask in it. Quit living out half law, half grace. It doesn't work. Come under it. I heard an illustration this week and I'm, I'm, I'm going to share this for the kids and I'm kind of a kid so it, it blessed me. If, you're, if you don't like it, any illustration on grace will come short. So just, that's my, my presupposition. I want you to think of this. Say it's summer break. And, and let's just picture that you go to school and you get summer break. And, and that was always my favorite time of the year. I loved summer break. I, I did this dumb thing. I joined the swim team and we practiced at five in the morning all summer. You finally get to sleep in and you get up at five. That's, that was stupid. <laughs> but it's summer break and a father comes up to his son a good father and he says here's the chores that I want you to do for the summer and he gives him a list of all that he wants him to do with trimming shrubs and mowing grass and all these things and he said at the end of every week I'm going to come examine how you did and if you did it right and perfect I'm going to put a star up on this little thing for you <clears throat> and if you get a star every week at the end of the summer, I'm going to pay for you to send you to this camp that you've been wanting to go to your whole life, and that's going to be your reward. And the son says, all right. He applies himself so diligently to the task, the heat of the summer, and he's just tired, and all his friends are out there playing, and he's got to keep working. But because of the reward, he just keeps striving. I'm, I'm going to do it. And at the end of the summer, the dad comes up and says, son, I'm proud of you. Ten stars. Every week. And he gives them the pamphlet to the camp. It's all paid for. Here you go, son. And the son's like, wow. That's not grace. And many of you think and you live under that burden and that weight. Every day you're still trying to put the stars up there to perform, to get God to let you come to camp, which is heaven. And now I want you to think through this. Same structures. <clears throat> the son, it's a very hot day. And he's like most of my kids, and he finally gives up, <clears throat> and, and he blows it, and he doesn't do his chores. And at the end of the week, the dad comes in, and the son's just sitting on his bed, just sad, going, I blew it, dad, I blew it. I don't get a star, and I don't get to go to camp at the end of summer. And the father says, yes, you, you did blow it. You deserve no star and no camp. That's true. And then the father puts a star on for every week because he did all the chores. And he says, you're still going to camp. And the son goes, I don't deserve it. And the father goes, yeah, that, that's grace. It's the opposite of what you deserve. And the reward just flowed out of the loving heart of the father. And the great sin of the world and the church today is that we think we deserve it. I hear this all the time that 
surely God's not going to throw me into hell. I, de- I deserve, I'm a good person. I'm better than so many other people. For as by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. So I just want you to hear that you trying to keep and do everything that God has asked, you'll never be able to keep it. He doesn't owe you salvation. Grace is that we all deserved hell and he gave us salvation. Grace, trace it all the way back. It goes into eternity past in Ephesians 1 before the foundation of the world. And then it moved into history where he who was rich became poor so that we who were poor could become rich. And he came and he went up on a cross and he died in our place. And he lived the life that we should have. And then the Holy Spirit in time and space brought us to faith and repentance. And this grace that we're learning makes you holy. It sanctifies you. It changes you. And it's a grace that will protect you. And it's a grace that will bring you all the way home to glory. And when you get there, you'll just say it was all of grace. I owe it all to Christ. Your merit will never make up any of your salvation. And that's why in Acts 20, 24, it's called the gospel of grace. It's a gospel that God will do it all. And he's the one who's going to set his love and predestine and call, justify and sanctify and bring you to glory. I just want you to treasure grace. And we've heard this hymn a million times and I just came back to it so fresh this week. I've been reading his book, so I just have learned to love John Newton. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I've already come. T'was grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Paul wrote in Ephesians 1, 6, this gospel is to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he has freely bestowed on us in the beloved. It's all of grace, and it's in Christ that he freely bestows it upon us. What is bound up in the word grace? That's the banner over all the saints in Philippi and all the saints in Southside. Grace is over all of us. Isn't that beautiful? I want that for all of us. And then he says, peace. Grace and peace. Shalom. Every form of prosperity and blessing to rest upon you, believer. When the grace of God comes upon you, it makes you safe and it brings great peace. It brings an objective peace and a subjective peace. The objective peace is that you were an enemy of God. Your sin, you just waged war against God and you wanted to be God and you fought him daily. It was a cold war that nothing could break the relationship in this war between you and God. Nothing could stop it. All of his wrath was encamped against me and I'm fighting him with my little pea shooters and this is a war. And God is the one who acted to end this eternal war that I would would go to hell and fight with him and hate him for all of eternity. That war would have never ended and God sent his son into the world to end it. And he brought the terms of peace. He acted to bring peace because we never would have. He brought his son into the world. And then he's come and he's died and he lived. And there's no more war. He ended it for the Christian. I want you to hear that. The war is over. (laughs) Enmity is gone. It's been removed in Christ. And now there's a true peace, not like between Israel and the other nations. It's just these fake peace treaties. Ours is real and eternal. We are friends of God's forever. We're adopted into his family forever. And we have a perfect reconciliation with God. You sit here this morning in peace with almighty God. 
<laughs> Nothing can break it. You can try to start a new war and it cannot change it. There's nothing that can make that war come back. Christ took it down. And because of that, there's a subjective piece. The fruit of the Spirit. Paul's going to later write in Philippians 4, 6 that you have peace that will guard your minds. It will guard it in trials and afflictions and unstable economy, terrorists, wars, and rumors of wars. You can have peace like no one else in this world right now. This gospel has brought peace with God, and now I've got peace in my heart. I don't have anything to fear. I have God. <clears throat> the gospel is called the gospel of peace. Romans 10, 15. And how shall they preach unless they're sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things and having shod your feet in Ephesians 6 with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So grace and peace to you, Southside Bible Church. The whole letter has to be lived out from this canopy. I've, learned, I've seen this over and over again in my own life and in those I shepherd. You can't live out Philippians without the grace of God and the peace that comes from knowing him through this gospel. You'll never be able to live as citizens of never, another world. You'll never be able to be content in all things till we get this. And so as we begin... I pray for every one of you that you would have grace and peace. You would live into this reality. You cannot do an end around to obey and please God. You must come under this banner of the gospel. And so as we close, how do I get under it? Well, I get under it, Paul says in verse 2, from God our Father. The only way under this banner is from God. And so you can't get under it from doing the sacraments. You can't get under it from your church. You can't get under it from your pastors and you can't get under it from all your hard work. There's no way under this canopy but from God the Father and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ has come and brought peace. I keep thinking of the Lord. In that day, Caesar, they'd say, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord. And there was one thing that Caesar could not bring, peace. I'm just gonna say this for free. Trump cannot bring peace. I want you to quit looking to anything else for your security and peace but the reigning Lord Jesus Christ who is your Lord and your Savior. Grace and peace to Southside Bible Church. And as we close, I just want to say something to unbelievers because there are some of you that don't sit under this canopy. Your canopy is religion. Your canopy is trying to clean yourself up so that God would love you. And that's what you're living under today. But without the canopy of Jesus Christ and what's being offered to you this morning is the gospel, you are under the wrath and condemnation of God for your sin. And nothing can get that off you but the Son of God bearing the wrath of God for your sin on a cross. And that's what he's saying, will you come to me that I could get that off you, that I could take that punishment and set you free and cleanse you from your sins this morning. Would you come under the canopy of Jesus Christ and not religion this morning? Come out from all your works trying to make God love you. Come to the one, Jesus Christ, who can bring you under the infinite love of God and safety and peace and grace. You don't deserve to go to camp you have no stars on your record. It says our righteous acts are like a filthy rag. There's none righteous, not even one. There's only one whose record was perfect, Jesus. And there's only one who died for all of your transgressions against God. So my pleading this morning is, would you flee to Jesus Christ and be saved? His arms are outstretched and ready to receive all who will repent and believe in him alone. And he'll bring you under this canopy of grace and peace this morning. I, I, I hope you can see what's being offered to you by God. Come to Jesus. I'm going to close with some application for the believers. I always hate to stretch myself, but I'm going to try it. So if you guys could flip up my, my handout online there. Okay. I just... 
As we go into Philippians, I want you to see what, we're, what I'm after and what I'm trying to get after even this morning. And so this is from what's uh, it's called a call to obedience CTO. <laughs> this first chart is I just want you to consider, you see that little uh, dotted thing at the bottom? I don't know what they're called. Some kind of code. QR code. If you take your phone and put it on that, you, you can look at this when you get home. And I really want you to. So if you could do that or even take a picture, and then there's 50 handouts for the first 50 people on the way out at the visitor center, you get one of these. And what I'd like is for you to just look this over next week before we begin the next section, because he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. This is what I think will help bring clarity. So I want you to see these unbiblical goals is, is my goals. Do we got the wrong one up there? Yeah. Oh, we got both. So the first one I want to look at is living for my kingdom. And when you come in, Adam, this is how you come in. And your goals are this, to have an ideal life, to live a happy life filled with pleasure, to live a pain-free life free from suffering, to have a secure and stress-free life, to have life under my control and on my terms, to have God, people, and circumstances cooperate to meet my goals. That's what it means to be an Adam. And you come in and you want to control your world and you want to control everybody else to have this, this life with no pain, no struggles, and no difficulties. And it doesn't take long to learn that that doesn't work. So my sinful beliefs in that diagram on the top is I deserve to reach my goals. I can control my world and achieve my goals. God exists to give me what I need to reach my goals. We, we'll use God and religion. Some of you are doing this every day. I'm using God so I can get what I want out of my life and what I need. It's called health, wealth, and prosperity, and we do it the same way as reform people. And we're just trying to use God to get what I really want out of life. I will use my own resources to reach my goals. <laughs> and you see that little roadblocks and all those little cute cars and all that? You look at life as these are the people, the things that are keeping me from having this life that I want. And I, I view difficult people as in my way. Painful circumstances are in my way. Failed expectations are in my way. Rejection, illness, losses. I, I just, again and again, you look at that and say, this is what's in the way of my life being the way I want it. And I'm going to use God, I'm going to use people, whatever I have to do to get my life into that place of no pain, the way I want it run. And people will spend their whole lives doing that. Turn to the biblical goals now, if you could. You're so far ahead of me. <laughs> this is what happens when grace comes into your life. God's goals now become yours. And you want to glorify him. And you want to know him intimately and you want to grow in godliness, and you want to serve an eternal purpose. And this is what happens when you're born again and God circumcises your heart. And now you want the transformed life where, where, where it's a byproduct of God working in me as I live obediently. The fulfilled life is the presence of God in me as I surrender to him. And so what I want you to see now is, is instead of obstacles, roadblocks, now I can begin to look at life in a different way. And I can look at difficult people as what God's going to use to sanctify me. Did you hear that? God's going to use painful circumstances now to grow me in Christ. He's going to bring failed expectations so I'll hope in God. He's going to bring rejection so I can treasure my acceptance in Christ. And he's going to bring illness to have to hope and look for the next world. And he's going to bring losses and he's going to bring persecution to sanctify you and change you and transform you. Do you see the difference? One is a natural mindset, my world, no pain. I'm going to protect everything. Um, and we come and now there's a mindset that I am going to, everything is from God and for God and to God. And I'm going to begin to see that there's a new way to look at how God grows and sanctifies and makes me like Jesus Christ. And that is going to be where we're going to go in Philippians. And I want you to see one thing. God gives those resources. Could, you, could he give you anything more than Jesus Christ? He gives you the Holy Spirit. He gives you scripture. 
He gives you the body of Christ, and, and those are so beautiful. Why does he have to throw suffering up there? He's going to say, I've granted not only for you to believe, but also to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. He's going to put faith and suffering on the same level. And we're going to begin to renew our minds that suffering is a big way of how God is going to change and conform us to the image of Christ. And I look at these godly beliefs on the far right side. I deserve nothing but to burn in hell. That's grace. I, I don't deserve anything. It's all free. I exist for God's purposes, not my own. I view trials and sufferings as opportunities to draw on God's resources to reach his goals. I die to self-will and submit to God whatever the cost as Christ did. I accept every circumstance, including trials, as ordained by God for my eternal benefit to fit me for his kingdom's purpose. And so what I want you to see this morning is those two charts. There's only one way to get from the, the, the natural mind to the spiritual mind. And it's through grace and peace. And when you understand the gospel of grace and what God has done, and now you have peace that he's your father and he's working everything for good and I can trust him. I can now look at everything that comes into my life. It's from God for my good. And I gotta quit trying to make God fit the life that I want and what I think is best and to come and humble myself under the hand of God and let him work in your life. And I'm telling you, that's peace. That is the grace and peace that we're gonna shoot for as we go through Philippians. So any questions? I have a bunch. I have a bunch. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I thank you for this identity. Lord, that you made us willing bond servants. I hated obeying your rules. Now out of love, I just want to please you. Thank you for that work that only the cross could do. I thank you for this sweet identity and what you've given us in being saints and union in Christ. But God, I thank you now as we begin to seek your face in Philippians. We want to be changed. And we want to go from never being content because we have our own plans and our own will and our own desires, always struggling and fighting your will and trying to use you to get your will to be ours. God, thank you for the gospel of grace where we are now brought in to relationship with you and the way you did it, you have our hearts. And now we're in peace. We have objective and subjective peace before you. God, would you grow and teach us now how to live surrendered, trusting you, how to let you bring the things into our lives that will be perfect in your wisdom to conform us to the image of Christ. Help us to quit trying to be controllers and our own securities and our own dreams and how we're going to do things. God, help us to come under the beautiful will of God gladly. Let the cross make it a glad surrender to every soul here this morning. God, set us free from this self-will and self-protection and self-security. Let Christ become our all and all. That we would learn how to be content in all things because of this sweet Christ. God, meet us in a powerful way now as we journey through this. And I pray for grace and peace for every soul in this building right now. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.